Hello. Hey. So, don't you feel good right now? Don't you feel like democracy's been saved and everything's great? I love it. I feel like I can finally go to brunch again. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah, I just don't I just don't want to have to worry about, you know, the bad orange man anymore. I know, and we have a new queen in the White House. I'm so excited for that. Yes. That wasn't yassy enough, was it? That was kind of Yeah, a no, ground. you need you need way more A's in that. My bad. <laughs> Ugh, that was my Instagram yesterday. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I keep, I forget that you were too much, you were exposed to that world too much. <laughs> the one that made me really mad was one that was like mad at you if you weren't celebrating. Mm -hmm. That was like, if you're not celebrating right now, that means you're super privileged. And I'm like, I know I'm privileged, but like, I also know this isn't good enough. Like, whatever. Yeah. I don't know. No, and uh, okay, I guess I get that point. I of get view it, in, but I don't get the point. Uh, good people are happy right now because yes, things are going to be are not going to be as existentially terrible for so many people. It's less bad. Yeah. On the other hand, though, it's still gonna suck. It's worrying for me just because I saw such an outpouring of relief that I'm like, you fuckers, it's are not over. Give up, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. And in addition, you know, the counterpoint, the the more global standpoint that the uh, pushback would be you know what actually being happy about this is a privileged position it means you're in the heart of empire and you're not you know you're not somebody in afghanistan or iraq going to be on the other hand of a drone strike that's now coming from a good guy instead of a bad guy <laughs> oh. so that's yeah. privilege too it's true it's true yeah it was just i'm just worried i just want everyone to be angry still i they was want. still liberal when Obama was in office, so I, I don't know. I haven't really been a, a radical while the closer party to me was in office. Yeah, that's probably tough. Because, I mean, everyone should be like, why are you so mad? We're here. Yeah, I don't know. Or please stop criticizing. <sighs> we don't need that right now. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about in our election coverage that I kind of wanted to briefly bring up was a proposition that passed in California. Did you hear about this? I did. I don't know anything about it. I've read some headlines about it. Well, it was called Prop 22, and uh, it was heavily, it was bought and paid for, basically, by... That's what I thought. The rideshare <laughs> companies, yeah. They put millions of dollars into this. Not suspicious mm. at all. I don't know why they mm -hmm. would put millions of dollars into this campaign to help their own workers rather oh, yeah. than pay it's their own really workers, yeah, probably really good. Right? So... I, they're probably just nice companies, Uber, Lyft. You know, yeah, probably. That's how they got to where they are, by being nicer than the <laughs> other companies. What it actually does is it classifies app-based drivers as mm -hmm. independent contractors Fuck. and not employees. Fuck, that sucks. And, you know, the way, the way that those laws go in California or whatever, when you pass something by a proposition, really the only way to get rid of that is pro another proposition or mm. you have to have it's crazy it's like a constitutional amendment or something but like even more you know you have to you would have to have like seven eighths or something ridiculous of the legislature to to change any part of that unless you do it through Jesus. you know a proposition so that's insane yeah that passed 58 to 41 oh that and sucks everything i was reading was like man i bet a lot of people didn't know how like shitty this would be I'm sure. I'm sure they just like thought like, oh, logically that makes sense. But it's like, oh God. Yeah, because the way they were pushing it, the way that Uber and Lyft were pushing it was like, hey, you know, all of our drivers, you know, support this, please do this. But what they had was every time the driver would take a fare, they would have to be like, do you support uh, Prop 22 or another button that was like cancel or something? It, were too, it was like <gasps> yes or cancel. So they oh had no drivers God. who opposed it because they never asked them that question. <laughs> And they had so many of them who would just be like, yes, to get through to the, to take an affair. The UX team that designed that should be shot. That is so <laughs> bad. Like my job, we talk about like ethics in design and like how you can definitely force people to do some shit and like trick them into paying more money or whatever. And that's just so bad. That is what they did. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't wait to tell some coworkers about that. That's juicy. <laughs> Jesus. All right. You want to get into... <laughs> Our main topic, though, now that we've got the lighthearted sure. stuff out of the way. <laughs> yeah, let's move on to this very lighthearted movie. Yes, it's uh, a great it's kind of like a dark comedy. Mm -hmm. Figured we would take a break from the transition of power, the fraught transition of power here. 
The dark comedy of life. <laughs> yeah, and take a look at a fraught transition of power elsewhere in the world with a movie called The Death of Stalin. There we go. I didn't do anything to prepare. I Kyle made me cocktails last night, so I just drank and watched the movie. Was it was say, good. You watched the movie at least. I watched the movie, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's some hard work. Yeah. Viewers, if you want to pause and go watch the movie before you listen to us, you can check it out on Netflix or you can pirate yeah. it in some other way, you know. That's also good. <laughs> if depending on when you're listening, of course, you know how they rotate through things. Hopefully That's it's true. still there on Netflix. The Deaths of Stalin by Armando Iannucci. Okay. He's the same he's the same guy that uh, that did Veep. Oh, okay. So this is his thing. Yeah, it did Veep and uh, a show called The Thick of It. And there was also a movie okay. follow-up to that called In the Loop, which was really funny. Okay. So he, he likes portraying incompetent governments. That's his thing. His thing is, yeah, kind of the foibles <laughs> of people in power. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you want to just like start from the top? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Scene opens up. We're in a concert hall. Mm -hmm. There's a pianist playing Mozart, maybe. Uh, some sort of classical, not very good at, at composers and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they said Mozart later. Okay. So it is. Mo okay, cool. And, uh, the concert is just about to finish. The guy takes a call in the recording <laughs> or in the like sound monitoring studio thing, uh -huh. takes a call. He's nervous. And he's like, that was fucking comrade Stalin. Like he wants a recording of the, of the show, <laughs> but they hadn't recorded it. Oh, I loved this. It was great. They were like trying to fill their room again because people had left. <laughs> They're like, get fat people. So it's like the same <laughs> sound, but with less people. Yeah, we don't have to get as many of it's them. Very good. They just, you know, a comedy of errors ensues where they have to try to scramble. He, he runs back into the room and he's like, no, 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 no. Lock all the doors. Lock all the doors. Sit down, sit down, <laughs> sit down. Do not defy me. Do not defy me. That was good. And uh, they have to round up everybody. The the conductor passes out, not gets knocked out, <laughs> and uh, they have to like. <laughs> I love this scene. It's juxtaposed with the secret police going around and rounding people up. Yeah, yeah. So you think that this conductor is gonna get shot, and then no, they just need him to come conduct in his bathrobe. Yeah, <laughs> just haul him down to the concert hall. They, yeah, they haul, they haul him there. They force the pianist to stay, even though she's like, no, I'm not going to do it. I hate this guy. I hate stuff. Yeah. I was so mad at her though. Cause it's like, it's people could die if you don't do this. It's not just you, you know, like everyone else could get shot. Yeah. She was going to take this brave stand and then she, what does she do? She does it for her money. I know. What a bitch. So did you kind of want to look at what things in the movie kind of happened or didn't happen or how they happened? Yes, I do. Okay. Because... Yeah, I, I couldn't quite tell. I'm like, probably these people, I mean, I assume these people are real and I assume that, you know, the basic gist of that happened. But the, f the weirdest part about this movie, we were probably like three quarters of the way through and Kyle turns to me and he goes, is this a comedy? <laughs> like, because he's like, this seems like they're really incompetent. I'm like, yeah, babe, that's like the point. <laughs> and I don't know. It was just funny. Oh, so he thought it was kind of like, here's this morbid. I think so. I'm not sure. Like, Maybe I didn't. You just thought it was a drama? Like... <laughs> think so uh yeah it's, i mean it's supposed to be a comedy you know uh about that but so you're right that like everything's seems like it's real people mm -hmm. real-ish situations that's kind of how it ends up being is like based on for the most part yeah. based on things like the that timeline happened or were, were alleged to happen timelines off particulars are off that sort of thing yeah yeah for example this concert may not have ever happened we don't really know uh, interesting it is only recorded in one source, a book by a Soviet defector named Solomon Volkov. Okay. It was called Testimony, and it was supposed to be like sort of the memoirs of Dmitry Shostakovich, mm -hmm. the Soviet composer. It's supposed to be a memoir of his or whatever. It's allegedly not, not very memoir-ish about him. It's kind of like half this guy's writing, half Shostakovich writing. Point is... People are like, this is the only source for something that allegedly, like, totally happened. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. If it did, it would have happened uh, nine years before Stalin dies. <laughs> okay. Okay. That timeline part is off as well. Uh, the pianist in question, Maria Udina, mm -hmm. was in fact an opponent of Stalin. Okay. It was because she was very religious. I think they mentioned that kind of in the film. She yeah, thought. she was very religious. Yeah. She was deeply, you know, religious and opposed to Stalin because of that. 
Uh, she does do the note move. She 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 writes gives a note. a note to Stalin. But this is supposedly like after different sources say different things. Either Stalin just gives her a gift of twenty thousand rubles, <laughs> or she gets like the Stalin prize for music or something like that and gets twenty thousand. Uh, okay. But either way, she sends a note to him saying, "Dude, thanks for the money. I'm gonna give it to my church and I'll be praying for all your terrible sins." <gasps> That's very spicy. Allegedly, when Stalin receives the note. Everyone's looking looking to him like, dude, we got you if you want to execute this girl. Like, it's fine. And he's just like, haha, just put, puts it to the side. He's just like, that's okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> oh, my God. That's crazy. Because, I mean, they really hated the church back then, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That comes into play later. Who invited the fucking bishops? <laughs> that was great. <laughs> oh, my gosh. She doesn't get executed ever. She just ends up peacefully dying in 1970. Uh, what else? What else? The conductor conductor didn't actually get knocked unconscious <laughs> he was too nervous to lead the orchestra like he just Aww. was fucking shaking and stuff so yeah they had to try to find someone else but he was also too nervous they ended up settling on their third replacement <laughs> and yeah that was that was it uh, as far as the alleged concert goes because we again don't even know it happened <laughs> if this happened oh yeah. that's great i mean it was a good device for setting it up it really showed how fucking scared everybody was yeah and so. it's not too far-fetched i don't think i don't think so either it makes sense for it to have happened or for at least for it to have been possible to happen so yeah that was kind of how we opened up the scene meanwhile they were having like this meeting mm -hmm. they were at stalin's house basically the ministers and everything yeah yeah uh we're introduced to several ministers there including of course stalin himself yes and we have nikita khrushchev played by steve buscemi steve buscemi he did a great job yeah, oh my gosh i loved it I mean, he does a good job in everything but uh we had laverenti beria yes we had that guy sucked beria is terrible we'll get into him <laughs> Uh, okay. We have Vyacheslav Molotov, okay, who is played by Michael Palin uh, from Monty Python fame. Okay, I thought I recognized him. Yeah, yeah, and you also have Georgi Malenkov there. Oh my God, lo I loved him. Jeffrey Tambor was so good in that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and they're all there talking, having a good time, making jokes about turning, uh, turning Prussians into soup. <laughs> oh my God. All these old soldier jokes, basically. Yeah, yeah. And a couple things come out here, I guess. So one is they're watching movies. They're watching movies in this like mm -hmm. home theater thing. They're watching a Western. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was surprising. And uh, in fact, Joseph Stalin really did like Westerns. He was a big Western fan. I'm so... I would not guess that. That's so like American and like individualism, you know. Yeah, he was a he was a movie buff in general. He he loved Western film and Western the genre in particular, Westerns. Uh huh. Um, he was a big fan of John Wayne, not the person, of course. Yeah, but, probably not. <laughs> the actor. <laughs> Uh, he apparently was such a film buff that he wrote scripts and song lyrics and story and title oh ideas and stuff. I hope they were bad. I have no idea. I haven't seen them or anything, but they've got to be. We'll have to dig those up and see if we can. Yeah, that's. We can read some good, some good Stalin fanfic <laughs> material. Yeah, right. So, yeah, that was a real thing. Uh, let's see. So, Beria was like giving out orders kill lists and stuff yes. he has this list approved and then he goes and and drops it off with everybody right he, he explains to him like make sure to kill this oh that was horrible kill this one first what? make him watch that sort of thing oh that's just like <laughs> so bad and then he just casually goes back and it's like it's fine mm -hmm. so he's like the head of basically their secret police yeah he um okay. was head of the nkvd yeah the secret police uh he is a super evil dude Okay. Yeah, he seemed like it. <laughs> when Stalin met with met with FDR and the uh, the other Allied leaders at the Yalta conference during World War II, mm -hmm. he introduced Beria to FDR as R. Himmler. Who's Himmler? Referring to Heinrich Himmler of the Nazis, uh, the head of the oh, SS. Shit. <laughs> okay, that's very bad. Okay. Uh, yeah, one of the main architects of the Holocaust. He refers to. Bury it as our guy like that. <laughs> Jesus, that's not good. Yeah, no. Secret police, NKVD, all operating under Barry's orders. And they 
I mean, it's a secret police force. They're going to do shitty things. Like, we're just <laughs> yeah, generally yeah, opposed sure. to those existing. Abolish the police <laughs> yeah. and the secret police. <laughs> uh, an example of their atrocities would be the uh, the Cotton Massacre, or Katyn okay. Massacre. I don't actually know how to say it. Okay. It was a massacre in Poland uh, in the early years of World War II, where the NKVD executed around 22,000 people. That's so many people. Polish people executed after they uh, after the Soviets invaded their country in 1940. This was remember when we said that like the Soviet Union and Hitler like mm. signed that agreement. They're kind of friends. Yeah, and they yeah. agreed let's divide Poland up. And yeah, yeah. So, so they took their half. They executed and 22, killed thousand people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the this Jesus. is actually where the most prolific executioner and mass murderer in recorded history. Did his mark? Uh, that was Vasily Bloken. Okay. He was just a guy, and and the chief executioner there, though, and under Beria's orders, personally killed seven thousand Polish POWs in twenty-eight days. That's about a rate of one every three minutes. Oh my God! Did he like line them up so he could just like use one bullet? Like, geez, just the, no, the efficiency he, um, is terrifying. <laughs> yeah, they. It was just this mechanical process basically just you know Jesus. he would be in this room with a slanted fo floor and a drain in it and then they would walk him in Jeez. close the door he would be behind the door blam they'd clean up the body he'd reload and the uh, next guy but like why did they kill all these people um there are stated reasons i guess <laughs> yeah what was their excuse there's no reason to do that some of them were officers in the uh, some of them were officers in the polish army or whatever mm -hmm. some of them were police officers and these guys i guess they would say they're just like counter-revolutionary whatever potential okay. elements for rebellion you also just had um members of the polish intelligentsia just educated people they were deemed okay. to be suspected of either being intelligence agents gendarmes landowners saboteurs factory owners lawyers officials priests anybody who Fuck. they thought might be a problem Fuck. Yeah. Not good. So, yeah, that's that's something that Beria was all about, was signing off orders to do. And it's something that collective leadership of the Soviet Union also played a part in, which we'll get into later. Yeah, I mean, they all they all went along with it, so. Yeah. Beria was also a monster in the fact that this guy has literally has an entire section of his Wikipedia page called Sexual Predation. Wow, that's not a good sign. Yeah. Okay, so in the movie, yeah, he... I. I was so concerned <laughs> like uh, they show him like swapping out this little girl into like a prison i was like this girl had to be like 13 or something oh so creepy like and i i don't know like that so this was real yes yeah that was real oh nope too much i mean i guess i'm fine with talking about executing seven thousand people but i don't really want to get too much into the gruesome no details i of, don't either of his uh of this part but yeah he in the film we see he's later charged with something like 300 something counts of rape real thing he would drive around and like have his people pick up people off the streets and stuff for jesus if you want to read more about it you can definitely check out his wikipedia page yeah i i do have two questions about that mm -hmm. one at some point he says something like he would abuse like prisoners and stuff yes i assume he did that did that too yeah okay Two, I guess my larger point is what really pissed me off at the end of the movie, like they were, you know, reading his his charges and like they knew about all this rape and they didn't bring it up until they wanted to get rid of him. And it made me really fucking mad. So, yeah. Yeah, that also is the case. Everything that he's charged with at the end, they knew about ahead of time mm -hmm. and just didn't, you know, didn't put it into action. They didn't care. It was useful for them. Exactly. Ugh, gross. But that's the same thing Beria had done, you know, and at that point, you know, right before he's like, no, I have this on you. You did this. You did that. You did that. <laughs> that's hilarious. And yeah. He had his big documents. Yeah. So everybody was doing that to everybody else. Yeah. And just kind of like keeping it till they needed it. Ooh, it did not look like a good time. No. Now, you know, we could say what a uniquely bad organization or we could say what's what amount of that goes on already. Or still goes on in other contexts. Other other governments might do the same thing. Maybe our government does the same thing. Keeps, you know, files on people or whatever till it's useful. 
Oh, for sure. I mean, you watch any like period drama, that's like half of the scandals is like, oh, I know you slept with so-and-so, you know, like, yeah, that's the thing people do. Machinations. Yeah. Usually not on such gross of a scale, perhaps, but. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Barry is signing off on the death orders, sending his, sending mm -hmm. his squads out to, to round people up, haul them off. When he leaves the party, we see Molotov waving goodbye and Barry says goodbye forever. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Molotov got in trouble? Molotov was on the list. Jesus. This is another one where it does look to line up. Like, Molotov does fall out mm -hmm. of favor enough to eventually... Mm -hmm. It's um, debated whether he was really on kill lists, because I think that this is a claim by Khrushchev later. Khrushchev says, okay. hey, I got us out of that situation, and you, my friend, you were on the kill list, so, like, come on, side with me. <laughs> you did it. You know? You did kind of a Steve Buscemi impression just then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was intentional. That's my impression of, um, that's like how I see Khrushchev now. It's just Steve Buscemi. It's just Steve Buscemi. Yeah, it's later on when Khrushchev is like denouncing Stalin in his secret speech thing. That's where he's like, also, he was going to kill Molotov. He was going to kill this guy. Like he was, you mm. know, just kind of emphasizing how bad he was. Yeah. But anyway, we're like, oh shit, you know. Stuff's about to go down. Poor Molotov. He said he seems like he seems nice. Yeah, he seemed normal. Right. That's another thing that I kind of <laughs> like about the movie is that people seem generally normal. Yeah, yeah. They all were just like people. It felt like I don't know, like petty office drama, which like we've all been involved in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They seemed human. Everybody but Beria seems like a regular person. Yeah, you know, which I think is good because you know movies about the Soviet Union can always fall into this trope of making them seem like this strange other, right? Yeah, like very like hive mind, stoic kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know. And these people were like clearly selfish and like I mean, I think this movie went super far the other way where like these guys are fucking selfish idiots, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean, I think that was interesting. Like, I don't know. That was cool. Yeah. I agree with that assessment. They do kind of go into the bumbling idiot section. Definitely. But it was fucking funny. Yeah, it's that's funny. And it's good to like <laughs> laugh at powerful people. So yeah, we see Molotov riding off into the sunset. Maybe he'll die. Another guy that we saw in this situation, we get the introduction to, we said, uh, Georgie Malenkov played by. Ugh. Jeffrey Tambor, known for his role in Transparent. He's, um... He's a hilarious character in this. Uh, he's so fucking funny. So he was my favorite. Malenkov. I was I had to look him up because he's just not very. He's not a super prominent figure. Yeah. He does seem to kind of be this sort of ineffectual, kind of bumbling, indecisive guy. <laughs> Tries to please different people. Very influenceable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like literally, you could just go up to him and be like, "No, it, it, come with me," and he'd be like, "Okay." And they all treat him <laughs> like, like that too. It's like, "No, Georgie, you got to do this," you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> oh georgie he's there for just a little bit he is the one who takes power after stalin dies which we'll get to shortly he's eventually forced to resign kicked out of the party he gets exiled to kazakhstan uh, where he's he becomes the manager of a hydroelectric plant oh georgie that's, just, that's his life okay at least he didn't die true yeah i mean he did eventually <laughs> he never died <laughs> he's some no, some he's say still he's still around. out there managing that hydroelectric <laughs> plant today Oh, on a full moon, <laughs> you can see him. So that's our general cast of characters. Okay. After everybody leaves, Stalin reads the note from... The pianist. From the pianist. Laughs at it and dies. <laughs> Just falls yeah. over dead. Or falls over unconscious, I guess, right? Yeah, I really thought he died. So... Like, for they have this whole extended thing where they're like, should we get a doctor? Let's not get a doctor. This whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm pretty sure he's dead. Like, how is he not dead? Like... I don't know. I mean, I guess they checked his pulse. Yeah, the way they portrayed it, you know, at first makes it look like maybe he died, but they also portray the doctor and, and the diagnosis and everything. That's that's accurate. He had suffered a mm -hmm. cerebral hemorrhage and lost consciousness. Then they're able to kind of take care of him after that for a while, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it happened. The particulars maybe. I'm not sure about in terms of like finding him the next day and all that. Yeah, the whole timeline of it. Right. That was hilarious. That like there was a big thud when he fell over and like the soldiers were too scared to go check <laughs> on him. They're just like, I'm not fucking going in. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and that makes sense. It all that it fits in with you know the concert with this 
underlying fear that everybody mm-hmm. has of saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. Yeah, like um, Khrushchev, his character would go home at night and tell his wife all the jokes he made and whether or not people laughed at them mm-hmm. so he could review them the next morning to see if he was in trouble with anybody. Yeah. He would just cross them out and be like, oh, I'm not telling that joke anymore. That one did not land. <laughs> oh, my God. That was good. I should start doing that. Let's keep track of my jokes. <laughs> so the next day, they find Stalin laying there, pool of his own piss. Yep. And they call people over. They call yeah. the Politburo, the leadership, back mm-hmm. into the residence so they can talk about what the hell to do, what or what you know this big emergency. First of all, you have Beria get there and like do all his secret shit, right? He starts. Oh my god, he like burns some papers. He does he send out his hit then, or is that later? He he sends out. I think he sends out new lists at that point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's just like cancel the old list. Now I got to kill whoever I want. Mm-hmm. He, in doing so, I mean, he's canceling Molotov's execution. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, so I don't know what papers and everything he, he goes to get. I, it's, it's not said in the film. Uh, but it yeah. is true that he's the first one to arrive. So mm-hmm. Some shit probably went missing. Yeah, yeah why not? <laughs> he probably destroyed the, fu- the papers and shit on him. Whatever. Probably. Whatever files and stuff Stalin had on him, he got rid of those. I liked that scene, though, because he had to, like, get a key off of Stalin's body, use it to open a box that had another key in it, go to a safe, and then burn the papers is really paranoid. And drop the other papers out the window to the guy. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. There's, like, a soldier. Yeah. Uh, I think also what he was doing there in terms of gathering papers was gathering the particular files that he had on. Mm, On everybody else. On the other members of the Politburo. Yeah. So that he could blackmail them later. It's a big fucking snitch. Yeah sucks so everyone else shows up to khrushchev in his pajamas <laughs> i love it because i uh, he like <laughs> i love him but yeah it was great i love this scene because everyone did the same fucking thing and like kudos to these actors they all went oh my gosh like they <laughs> yes. all have the same reaction it was awesome. and like perfectly executed fake sorrow mm-hmm. like that uh, i mean I'm nowhere, I'm not an actor at all, but like that looks like such a challenge to be like, you have to make it look like you're trying to make it look real. Yeah, act but like <laughs> you're acting sad. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it was great. That's, but yeah, that's what they all did in turn and like. They all accidentally knelt in the piss. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ugh. They keep getting their shoes squishy or whatever. And then they have to like, they, and then they just kind of do some slapstick. They haul the. Uh, yeah haul his body off this is we see some other we see some other other ministers come into play you have uh mika jan kaganovich bulgan and all show up and these are all just the mustached guys yeah i the think mustache that's kind of what i called them in my head mm-hmm. mustache guys and then the white hair goatee man right yeah that one i think that's bulgan <laughs> i don't, don't know any of their names they're not they are leaders in the soviet union i just don't know much about them it tells you what their oh, title Lord. is there at the time, but they were like, you know, more minor leaders. Yeah. They do kind of poke fun at each other, whatever, and do this slapstick routine of pull, <laughs> hauling his body off to a bed and one of them gets rolled up underneath it. He's like, oh, you know. It's great. It's pretty ridiculous. There's a, a lot of talk here, though, that I liked that was like they're nervous about doing anything. They're. Oh, I love it. They're like, should we call a doctor? Like, that's a whole fucking conversation of Ooh. what doctor do we get? And like, all the doctors were sent away. I remember we talked about this in the episode. So uh-huh. I was like, oh, I knew about this. Yeah, that was, uh, they're referencing the doctor's plot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're saying, we don't have any good doctors. We <laughs> we executed all the good doctors. So any doctor that we find is not a good doctor. I love the logic, though. I think as Steve Buscemi's yeah. character, he was like, well, if it's a good doctor, then he'll heal him, and then he's a good doctor. Or, you yeah. know, like, he'll prove himself to be a good doctor. If he's a bad doctor, he dies, so nobody will know. <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah. Like, just getting rid of all the doctors, like, how would that... How would... These are a bunch of old men. Like, come on, have some forethought. Yeah. It was part of a overall campaign the case of the saboteur doctors or the killer doctors. Um, but this was an anti-Semitic campaign. Oof. Okay. 
targeting all these doctors, predominantly Jewish in the Moscow area that were accused of a conspiracy to assassinate these leaders, uh, these Soviet leaders. Okay. They just want to get rid of them. Yeah. Pretty much. Because they're racist. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, and I don't know if it was tied directly to it or not, or if it just also happened, but like Stalin's personal physician had been arrested <laughs> because he suggested that Stalin uh, should, should give up work, should like rest, <gasps> basically, should rest more. Oh. And he was like, the fuck are you trying to say? You trying to say I shouldn't be the leader <laughs> of the country? What the oh, hell? Oh, that sucks. And uh, had him arrested. So pretty much, yeah, they had wiped out their doctor corps in the city. Damn it. Who do we get? You know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So bad. They had to round up all these old people and like, they had the super young guy too. (laughs) That was great. Like everyone kept asking how old he was and he'd be like, uh, 29. 29. (laughs) Yeah. Or how old are you? (laughs) I'm old. I'm old. I'm going to start doing that. It's very good. And then like. I don't know, like his kids come in and like just insult them all. It's like you're just mostly hair. Like <laughs> it's really good. They just these poor doctors just get shat on. Yeah, they have that attempt of like trying to get everything together, trying to get the doctors there. The doctors have to try to find out what's going on. I guess this is where they bring in the kids. Yes, yes. So Svetlana and Vasily. Vasily, they're a piece man. of work. Vasily sucked. Vasily was hilarious and bad, and I think. <laughs> <laughs> so with minor details changed a little bit his his portrayal was pretty accurate okay they depict him as a a drunk complete alcoholic yeah someone suffering from alcohol addiction and overall kind of a failure seemingly yeah he was he did see this did seem to be what you know how his life was uh he joined the air force during world war ii Everybody hated him because they figured he was an informant for his father. Oh. So, and eventually he gets, he's only ever allowed to fly in missions under like a complete escort. Like he's surrounded basically. (laughs) Yeah. But eventually they recall him back to Moscow to just like oversee some training facility or something like just, or inspecting some some plane, uh, something dumb. Yeah. Bullshit job. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And, uh, he just kind of wastes his time there. I think he gets somebody killed in an accident, for, like Jesus. blowing up some stuff or whatever. <laughs> he's af- later on, he's put in charge of the national hockey team. Yeah, that's where they, they open up his scene. Is He's training these very bad hockey players. <laughs> yeah, and they mentioned a plane crash, right? Yes. So this is the time. It's a little off. It's about three years late. You know, it actually happened in okay. 1950. But in 1950, there's a plane full of the Russian national team that he orders to take off during a snowstorm. Oh, my God. And it crashes. Everyone dies. 19 people. Boom. Oh, my God. Wipes out the team. He has to get randos, basically, to. (laughs) That's so bad. To fill in. Stalin never notices. Of course not. Yeah. So that's what they're that's what they're kind of referencing there with (laughs) the terrible hockey team. Oh, that's so bad. Yeah, so Vasily, he's more of like an, he falls more into his alcohol addiction, like after Stalin dies, mm-hmm. but it's just, that's what they're referencing there with his whole character. I liked his speech about cubs. <laughs> Latvian cubs, <laughs> Lithuanian cubs. That's so Ukrainian good. This guy cubs. just loves bears. <laughs> <laughs> and then they do the flyover to like, ru- to, to, to cut, cut him off. off. Yeah, like, hey, hey, good, <laughs> so good job, bad. good job. <laughs> uh you also have Svetlana. Yeah, she was I mean understandably anxious. <laughs> right, and she was I don't know, reacting in a fairly sympathetic way, right? I mean Yeah, she seemed kind of normal. Yeah. <laughs> That's the most you can say for someone in these this movie is kind of normal. Yeah, she's um an interesting character. Later on in the in the movie, she gets virtually exiled to Vienna. Yeah, which I'm like, that sounds like a chill place to be. Yeah. Well, I guess no, not. No, no it would be fine. That would that would have been okay. Yeah, it's after World War II, so I guess you're okay. It's not how it happened, though. So. Oh. She, um, after Stalin's death, she stays in Moscow for a while, working as a lecturer and a translator. Mm-hmm. Um, she eventually defects to the West in 1967. Okay. 
She goes to the United States Embassy in New Delhi in India. Wow, I was I didn't see that coming. Yeah, she defects to America. And everybody's like, hell yeah, Stalin's own daughter defected. Oh, you know? God. Yeah. Those headlines were probably really painful. And so, yeah, <laughs> she moves to Switzerland for just a little bit and then goes to the United States, gives a press conference denouncing her father's legacy and the Soviet government, um, and then stays there for a long time. I think in the 80s, she briefly moves back to the Soviet Union, gets her Soviet citizenship back. Yeah, I yeah. I guess they were handing that out like candy or something. It was in the, op- <laughs> Please come back. the reopening thing, probably, right? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then she moved, she just like, I don't know why she did that. She's kind of strange in that way and just moves back to the United States and ends up living the rest of her life there. Wait, in the United States or in? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Weird. Kind of a strange uh, individual. <laughs> I mean, it could not have been easy being fucking Stalin's kid. Like, I... I felt very bad for both of these kids. Yeah. <laughs> because it's like you're not, I mean, it's not like a fucking monarchy. So like you're not, you know, you're not supposed to have power, but you do because everyone's so fucking scared shitless of your father. So that cannot be an easy life. Yeah, I would agree with that. Your father's literally always at work, basically, right? I mean, yeah. It's 100% of the time on the job, not paying attention to you. Yeah. Um, it what happened to their mom? seems like an asshole, you know, so... Yeah. Probably is an asshole as a father. Probably. What Who was their mom? What happened to their mom? Was she dead? So their mom also was like not Stalin's favorite of the wives that he had. <laughs> How many did he have? Well, he only had two, but she was like the second oh, okay. wife and she just wasn't. <laughs> hey, this. you know, she could have been worse. Could have been the least favorite out of four. Uh, well, her name is Nadezhda Alilulieva. Okay. She committed suicide. They mentioned that in the in the movie. Oh, fuck. Svetlana says something about it. Oh, okay. Shot herself after an argument with Stalin. Um, They fought a lot. So, yeah, these kids did not have it easy. For sure. So they get called in. They're either just being drunk or freaking out about the situation, (laughs) whatever. Yeah. Uh, They eventually, Stalin, like, briefly wakes up. Wakes up, yeah. Just after, like, so Beria had been putting all this stuff into place, and he's just kind of like, he's almost dead. Everything's good. It's great. Um, this is so great. When he, he wakes up and Beria's like, oh, shit. <laughs> this can't be happening. And he goes out. He, like, punches a wall or something. <laughs> so pissed. And then they come back out. I was like, oh, he's he's dead. It's fine. He, he's dead again. <laughs> so bad. Oh. But that's great. He like wakes up and points at this painting yes. and everyone's trying to interpret what he means. <laughs> he means so I good. am the lamb. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm the milk. And the, and the lamb is socialism. Yes. And it was so good. Just everyone doing these stupid interpretations of some fucking painting on the wall. Oh, oh or like when he first wakes up, he points at, I think it's a Khrushchev or somebody. Like and successor. they're like, is he a pointy? <laughs> yeah. And then he points to the, like the maid or whatever. <laughs> and they're like, maybe not. <laughs> uh, for sure. So oh. he finally kicks it and they're like, shit, we got to get back to Moscow. Cause they're in his docker or whatever. And they mm. have the kind of physical comedy of who's going to p- literally drive their car out of there first. <laughs> Like, oh, it's so on, bad. On. Everyone's just like honking at each other. And then they all like briefly get out to like take their hats <laughs> off as the body goes by. And then they just like they run back, run back yeah. to their cars. <laughs> so stupid. Okay. as just physical comedy. Right. But it's also this like this same with when they first see him die or dead on the ground there. It's this mm-hmm. display, this forced mm-hmm. adoration. Definitely, yeah. And I do want to keep that in our listeners' minds. You have this portrayal that I think is fairly accurate, probably, of this forced adoration among mm-hmm. the leadership, right? Among these guys yeah. who also have a stake in where things go next. And I think to some degree, some of them were, you know, sad that he had passed and mm-hmm. really had, you know, fought beside him, comrades had their own criticisms that they kept quiet about him, but, you know, did have some respect for what he had done sort of thing. Yeah. Mixed in with just let's, I actually do want to just get on with figuring out who's next and I want to try to stake that out. Yeah. But there was also a real like power vacuum, I assume. Yeah. That they were all scrambling to, 
and that that's what looks you know gross and 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 small to us is how everyone's mm-hmm. like clawing for clawing for the next step but i do want to want us to keep that in mind for a, a scene later on okay after that they run back to Moscow, and in the meantime they <laughs> they clear out the whole fucking house they just take that place down don't they what why are they doing that so at first is it because they don't want anyone to know he's dead because they're rounding up the staff too and i was like are they gonna kill these people or like what's going on with that they do. I, th- I think they kill like the soldiers that were that ran from their post thing, right? They, yeah, yeah. They, I, they haul a lot of people off. It's possible that they just put them in jail until they want to officially announce that he's dead. Jesus. I thought that the like dismantling of the place was simply like looting, because most of that would oh. have been just Stalin's personal shit at his house, you know. So just take that. I don't know oh, why else okay. they were clearing out all the food, all the everything. Yeah. I just figured that was just regular old looting. <laughs> yeah, I could not tell what was going on. I'm like, is it so like none of those guys can come back and get everything? Like, yeah, it was, that was kind of confusing to me. Yeah. I think that that whole scene was exaggerated. I really haven't done too much research into the specifics of what they did with this doc afterward. Yeah. Doc is just like house. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, like a country estate. But like a, a cottage sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a vacation oh, home. A nice cottage. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So that brings up something that impressed me throughout was their depiction of where people were living, where Molotov was living, where Khrushchev was living, like their houses, their apartments were just mm-hmm. like, they were kind of like boring. They were boring. They were not drab necessarily, but they were small. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting because yeah, Khrushchev goes to see Molotov, I think. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he's just like in some like shitty bathroom. Like it looks like any bathroom in like the 60s, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. (laughs) Like it's just like shitty green tile and like the toilet, you have to wait for it so you could flush again. Like, yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I think that, I think we talked about this in the myths of the Soviet Union thing about how, oh, the leadership, they got to live in these super opulent mansions and everything while the regular people had to, you know, and sure, the regular people had it worse than leadership, but the leadership was also not living in like, we're not talking Jeff Bezos versus regular people here. We're <laughs> talking, sure, that's a nice apartment. Like a peasant would be very happy to have that apartment. Mm-hmm. Regular but people it's not a palace. Too, but it's not a palace. Yeah. It's not like they were just, you know, kicking back, relaxing. and. Yeah. I thought that was an interesting choice because so much of this movie was clearly designed to be like, haha, communism sucks. Like, look at these idiots. But that part was like, I thought nice and like a good choice to be like yeah they're they're just regular people living in regular apartments you know from one angle yeah and i agree with that assessment i think you could if you're dedicated to trying to pull out every thing and say how can this be anti-soviet you could say they were so poor that even their mm. super we- their super top leaders were just like this is luxury to them you know yeah but i thought that was interesting uh so then we get to the to the meeting in Moscow about what to do next in terms of the <laughs> funeral and stuff, right? Oh, I love this meeting. So the way they pass things, they, they ask for like, like motions to pass. And it was so fucking funny that like someone will be obviously <laughs> for it. You know, a couple people uh-huh. raise their hands and then slowly everyone else would raise their hands and they'd be like, <laughs> passed unanimously. <laughs> yeah. And they oh, had so good. And Molotov was being like very particularly. He's like, hold on, there's you know, there's multiple agenda items at once. Which oh, one yeah, are we voting, voting on and everything? <laughs> yeah, they're voting on two things at once, so it's very confusing and like very forced, but I I loved this scene. It was very good. And then they make uh Khrushchev be the funeral <laughs> director. And he's like, yeah. no, fucking, this would be terrible. I, I don't want to do this. And everyone's like, whatever, <laughs> man, you'll be good. Yeah. We'll do it. So, it, you know, they, again, they take the vote and he's like, <sighs> everyone else climb. did it. <laughs> <laughs> he like slowly raises his hand. Oh, it's so good. But yeah, there's, so I love the like logical loop they get themselves into at one point. They're like, mm-hmm. okay, like, cause Beria wants to reverse the, um, he wants to stop the arrests. Um, stop the kill lists, all this stuff to make himself look better to the people. Yeah. And like everyone can see through that and they're like, okay, that's bullshit. Like you're, <laughs> you're the one that ordered all that shit. So like, yeah. whatever. 
but we were um, fine with it before yeah yeah so someone's like okay that's a good idea but like wouldn't it be more loyal to be loyal to stalin because those yeah. were approved by stalin this so is molotov like, yeah yeah molotov does that and then they go back and forth being like but isn't it more loyal to be loyal to the co collective vote and so they just like get in this weird like logical loop it cracks me the fuck up yeah molotov was doing that juking everyone out like everyone kept being like oh so we're oh so we're not <laughs> wait oh so we're they kept like oh, changing their vote uh, indication midway through yeah because like, i think they had already patriotic? raised their hands but the, he was the last one to raise his hand is what happened and so oh um, he was waiting so he was like well, maybe we should. Yeah. And so everyone else was like, oh, fuck, I fucked up. I raised my hand and I shouldn't have. But then, like, wait, no, 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 no. I, I want to be in on oh, this too. It's very good. I that brings it. up something that I forgot uh, about Molotov. Uh, and his brief rundown was so his wife. Had, yeah, this is the guy with the wife. Yeah, Polina. She had been arrested. Yeah. In 1948, she got arrested on trumped up charges of treason okay but he remained loyal to the party to the soviet union to stalin mm -hmm. remain loyal and just kind of took the party line that i mean she got arrested yeah so she had to be guilty <laughs> she just got arrested because stalin was paranoid or whatever but mm -hmm. he was like i mean she got arrested she must have done something wrong Oh, God. And he was loyal to that. And so that's why they portray him in the movie as undyingly loyal. And he goes through that loop that you were talking about in terms of figuring out what the correct way to view things is. Because he's been doing this the whole time in his own head. Yeah. Is figuring out how do I balance these dissonances? Yeah, because it comes up later, too. Like, uh, so Beria gets his wife out. Mm -hmm. and basically returns her to him and it's really awkward because he and and fucking <laughs> khrushchev were just talking about his wife and like oh yeah she's a fucking traitor and then she walks in with beria and it's <laughs> like obviously like... it was fake <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like but then still later he's still second guessing it like at the funeral he's like she must have been a traitor like whatever mm -hmm. and then barry's like i released her so like so now Obviously you're wrong. she's not. Yeah. yeah, it's super fucking awkward. And then awkward. he's like, I apologize. I'm sorry. I believe the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> he just can't get it together. He is a, He would be perfect, though. Like, if everybody were like that, you would have this perfectly unified Soviet society. I mean, it would be dumb because everybody would be <laughs> agreeing to whatever decisions were made, even if they were bad. But, but you can see how that falls apart, though, because... If everyone is like that, all it takes is one person to just like whisper their idea and then everyone agrees to it. Mm hmm. Yep. I mean, that's what happens with Georgie. No, oh, Georgie. Yeah. He just <laughs> goes with whatever someone said. Yeah. <laughs> He's so cute. <laughs> but, um, so that thing did happen about Polina. Okay. And about Polina's release. Maria does release her. Probably wow. not as dramatically as portrayed in the movie with the whole <laughs> scene they were just talking about her, but yeah. No way to know. But yeah, that does happen. Yeah. And it's definitely just so he can get Molotov on his side, right? Yes. Yeah. It's yeah, it's just for that, really. And he, I think she had just been arrested on Stalin's orders. I don't think Beria had anything really, no one had anything on her specifically. So it made sense as part of the release thing to release her too. But you're right. It's plus also a favor to, <laughs> to Molotov. Yeah. Khrushchev's in charge of directing the funeral. Mm -hmm. And the funeral kind of takes the center stage for the last part of it. This is another thing where things are sped up. The funeral does happen, but the rest of it, the coup and everything, okay. doesn't take place till way later. That's pretty common in period pieces. Yeah, I'm not, I don't... The King's Speech is all over the place with timeline. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, I yeah. Never, I never bothered to break that down. Oh, Every time I watch that movie, I end up reading the Wikipedia for it. So <laughs> <laughs> I've read it several times. So they have the funeral... They are planning for it, and it's just, you know, the hilarious personality of Buscemi as Khrushchev. It's very good. Shines through. He just, like, has to make all these inane decisions. He's like, I don't <laughs> fucking care. <laughs> and uh, I have questions about the funeral. So, like, yeah. so they let people in, like, through to see the body. Mm -hmm. And we were talking a lot about, like, the false adoration of, like, the inner yeah. circle. Do you, there's had to be some false adoration in the crowd too, right? I think there had to be. 
I'm sure some people are like, they legitimately thought or were brainwashed into thinking he was cool or whatever. But there was also some fear. Like, we have to act like we're upset. I think it would... Mm, I think it's flipped. I think mm. that there were some people who had reasons to, you know, to be cynical and just be displaying their outward adoration, but really not feel it. Sure. I think mm -hmm. that, that there was, there were lots of people like that, but I think that most of the people who would be in that category would be, uh, people who were better off in terms mm. of people with a little more power or with more to lose, uh, people, you know, like the pianist people like the middle feel, class. Yeah. The bourgeois. More of a middle class, uh, that sort of group. Okay. The people who were filing in. Yeah, they are like peasants, I guess. These people don't have a lot of interaction with leadership. They don't see Stalin as worse, really. They know that you can't, you know, step out of line or bad things happen. And, you know, there can be anybody who had personal interaction with that. Definitely. There's a big chance that they were like, fuck this guy. But I got to yeah. look like I'm sad. But if you're talking about somebody who whose son died in the war against the Nazis... And this is the guy who led the country to defeat the Nazis, you know, even when they had invaded half their country. There's a lot of adoration. Yeah, there. that's uh, true. And, and at, in, after the country was reduced to ashes in so many parts of it, how uh, they had rebuilt and were now on par to catch up with the West in such a short time. It's a good point. People like, you know, the cult of personality was, was put out there and was proper and was, you know, a lot of propaganda to get people on board with that. But I think people underestimate sometimes how popular Stalin was with regular, with, with ordinary Russians. Yeah. It's like, it's, if you were in his inner circle or even like the upper middle class, you were going to be more paranoid because you were more likely to be taken out. But yeah, regular folk, like they didn't, why would he give a shit if they don't like him? You know, if they said some shit, like no one would be there to hear it. They are pretty much safe for the most part, unless they like go out in the street and be like, "Someone sucks, ha ha!" Like, yeah, <laughs> they're probably to do okay something about it. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, they're. You're right. They have less. They're less. They have less threat. reason to be paranoid. Mm -hmm. And again, that's not to say that it's 100. percent Obviously, lots of them, I'm sure, had real criticism of it. But I think, especially when you get to the bridge scene of people trying yeah, to cross yeah. the bridge with the banners and everything. I think that the film tries to portray their sentiments as honest. I mean, why go up, try to go through troops if you're not honestly trying that's to a good point. see your fallen comrade or whatever? Like, yeah, yeah. I think that's juxtaposing like their real sentiments and stuff with the, what we saw before with the, with the, <laughs> with the fake hats over the hearts <laughs> and all the fakeness. Yeah. The fake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we also get introduced to Zhukov here. Yeah, this guy was hilarious. He had so many fucking medals. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, and he had earned those medals in World War II. Like, he was he was the uh, marshal of the Soviet Union, uh, which is just, like, highest rank, you know? Mm -hmm. He's chief of the Red Army's general staff. He's, like, briefly, fi he's briefly fired um, or loses. <laughs> he's no, no longer chief of general staff after, like, they get invaded by Germany because they're like, what the fuck? Why did you let this happen? But he organizes the defenses of Stalingrad and, and Moscow and Leningrad and all that and, you know, ends up being the main guy. He's really popular for being this war hero guy, you know. So Stalin's always yeah. kind of suspicious of him, but he he comes into play here. He was also uh, Lucius Malfoy. <laughs> Sorry, I had okay. to look him up. Yeah, I, was like, I, I thought I he was in something else. That. What is his name? Jason Isaacs. Okay. I thought he did a good job. By this point, he had kind of fallen out of favor with Stalin. He had lost some of his ranks and was like put out in a remote military post. Mm -hmm. But when Stalin died, he was allowed to kind of come back in and retake, you know, reassume command and everything. Mm, uh, okay. Which I think the film kind of just ignores that he wasn't that he was... previously as powerful. Or, yeah. Uh, okay, gotcha. But um, he comes in and he's just this brash, hilarious dude. <laughs> <laughs> He's ridiculous. Then they have the contest over the trains or something because Barry is like, no, shut down the trains. We don't want to anything, anyone in here. We want to control people. Yeah. Make sure we don't. And then Khrushchev decides to open it up. Yeah. And they put together this plot of like, let's get rid of Barry. Uh, one of the things I think that happens here that should be corrected 
uh, is the film shows whenever the people come in on the trains and mm-hmm. trying, are trying to cross the bridge, there's a conflict with the soldiers there and then the soldiers start shooting them. Yeah. That doesn't seem to have happened. Oh, that, okay. That was a big plot point. <laughs> yeah. What happens there in is that people do die, but it seems like they were like trampled and crushed. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering about that. They die in that. I'm not, I don't recall. Uh, no. So they say something way higher, but it's, it ends up being 109 people trampled. Oh, I mean, it's still very crushed. bad. Yeah. But, but also there, you know, fewer people and not murdered by the state. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very different situation. So I don't know. I think that that's cause it, you know, those people shouldn't be like lumped into a thing that didn't happen i don't know so the rest of the funeral so that i they have that scene where they're standing around the body and they're like oh, passing messages to each other yeah <laughs> it's so good they're like tell so and so this like it's, they're like fucking middle schoolers don't it's order very me good. around but then he does it <laughs> and then he does it anyway so yeah they're like fucking passing notes to each other basically and they're trying to figure out who invited the bishops because the bishops show up <laughs> yes. and they hate them did you know that khrushchev hated religion so much that when his first wife died uh, and they were going to bury her in the cemetery the only entry to the cemetery was through the church but he refused to have her coffin moved through the church so he oh had God. the coffin crane lifted <gasps> into the cemetery that's hilarious and everybody was you know a lot of people anyway were horrified about it but he was like fuck it i hate that i hate the church that's so funny <laughs> uh but yeah no he everyone everyone was making fun of him, like the boyfriends of christ or something <laughs> yeah the boyfriends of christ that's good oh yeah they all fucking hated it and it was barry who invited them i don't know I guess he's just trying to be popular again he was trying to uh be less oppressive to the to the mm-hmm. churches remember that was kind of an off again on again thing is let's crack down on the churches oh never mind let's do because they, they keep mm, religion still stays throughout pretty much so yeah people are still into it mm-hmm. yeah so it's a way to gain popularity if you want to if you need yeah. to in a pinch in a pinch uh what else happens at the funeral i, I mean that's when when khrushchev starts plotting right he, he starts talking to everybody like okay you want to be on my side. We're going to take out Beria. And like, he just keeps lying to everyone and be like, yeah, everyone's a hundred percent on board. Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> and so yeah. that's how it gets everyone on board is by lying to them. Mm-hmm. And then they start the hilarious scene where they start saying like, Hey, Georgie, good job getting on board, man. <laughs> oh yeah. And then he's like, on board with what? What are they congratulating for? <laughs> so good. Oh, and um, I also want to talk about Georgie's fucking propaganda photos. Like, oh. Yeah. They have pictures like this one has more cheekbones, this one has less, and he's like, "I want that one destroyed." <laughs> <laughs> and they like have to track down this girl that like Stalin took a picture <laughs> with, like a girl in a field. So they mm. they first they try to get a girl that looks like her, and like, then they try to get the girl. real girl, <laughs> but she's too old, and so she's they go back ostrich. to she's the size of an ostrich. <laughs> It's so ridiculous. Uh, so yeah. he gets his girl and then it's for this like balcony wave. And mm-hmm. then she's too short to even be seen over the balcony. So it's just a huge fucking waste of time. Yes, that's great. That was in the speeches that they were giving when he was, uh, when, what was it? They each had their stupid speech that they gave. Oh, Obviously yeah, yeah. Vasily gave his cub speech. <laughs> I think Georgie's was, his was really something boring. about taking something a about pause. pause. Yeah. <laughs> I think that can be revolutionary too, or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very sad. Not great speakers. No, it was it was a uh, a criticism of the mediocrity of their bureaucracy. <laughs> there, I think. Yeah. So this is kind of where I get some some of this timeline mixed up, but there's a scene where Beria reveals his documents against all of them, and they have this big fight in front of that little girl, and um, it's really funny because afterwards, uh, I think. I don't know, maybe it's Molotov. Someone, one of them says like, oh, this is, comrades can do this. Like, that's how you know you're real friends. You can yell at each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, they have, so they have, you're right. They have that argument there on the landing. Uh, and it's before they have the actual coup go down. Yes. It's really where I think everyone gets cemented on board uh, mm-hmm. as if they were thinking, maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't do this at that point. They're like, oh, this guy's got all of our shit. 
let's kill yeah. him. When Barry, uh, you know, he thinks he's intimidating them or whatever, but he doesn't realize that his power is not complete yet. These guys still can totally take him out. And he just said, here's a big reason for taking me out. Yeah, I thought that was really stupid. <laughs> yeah. He thought that, you know, they still, I don't know. I guess he thought he moved too soon, right? Yeah. Once yeah. you're impact, once you're Stalin again, basically, then you can be like, bitches, look what I got on you. Yeah, yeah. But and so then they they pull off the the coup in the in the meeting room there. They just ambush Beria Khrushchev. Yeah. Says, hey, actually, you know what? No, we're doing this now. What was the point of the buttons? The button was to call Zhukov in. Okay, so they had to wait. Yeah, Zhukov was there waiting with his troops. They didn't want to roll him in until the right moment, so he would press okay. the button to signal that they were supposed to come in and do the coup. And like Khrushchev like fucking slides across the table to hit the button. It's very <laughs> good. George is like, what? what? I don't want to. <laughs> they they bring him in, and then things start rolling, man. Just yeah. This is one where they're also off in the timing. Like the whole thing, this coup doesn't happen till later in the first place. But even when they okay. do have the meeting where Khrushchev does ambush Beria in this in this kind of how it plays out here, uh, they mm -hmm. haul him off to prison for a while before they execute him. Okay, yeah. And he's in jail. He's not but here they just drag him out to a barn. <laughs> to a barn, yeah. Zhukov comes in, gives him a very satisfying punch. Oh yeah. And he's like, yes, I'm, I'm very glad this guy's getting punched. <laughs> <laughs> they drag him off. They they read all of his charges and they kind of like force Georgie to sign on all the charges. Well, what are you going to do at that point? I mean, yeah, if everyone's on board with it, like you kind of can't like or, or you're next. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, you know, at that point, you're in a not really even a kangaroo court. You're in just like a summary execution, a, a lynching kind of. Basically, yeah. Boom. You're, you're I mean, gone. this guy fucking deserted. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah. He does. Did if we're going to execute sure. anybody. <laughs> and death penalty is what it is. We don't like it. We're opposed to it. Yes, yes. But this guy sucks. I'm not sad when it happens to terrible people, I guess. Yeah. If it's going to happen. Uh, he gets executed. He, so this is an interesting point of, of, of getting it right, historically. Mm. And they really burn his body. They do cremate him, yeah. But he, you know, he's all like yelling and saying, no, I didn't do this shit, whatever. And mm -hmm. then when they're just like, we're executing you, he's like, no, please don't kill me. You know, and he like <gasps> begs and everything. Yeah. He did do that in real life, allegedly. And it's a parallel to his predecessor in the secret police job. Mm -hmm. uh, Nikolai Yezhov uh, was killed in the great purges that he himself had started. He ends up getting killed and allegedly begged for his life in much the same way. Oof. Okay. Before he was executed. So it's Damn. just, you know, it's a risky job. Yeah, don't start purges if you can't finish them. <laughs> yeah. So Beria gets shot through the head and they they burn him. I don't know if they burn him like that or what. Yeah, they just like poured gasoline on him. It was very intense. And Kyle's like, that wouldn't work. It would just burn off. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> no, I didn't either. I, don't, I haven't burned too many bodies. <laughs> yeah, right? I got to talk to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> they cremate him. The remains are buried in communal grave number three. I'm sure many people, I'm sure many of his own victims were in there. Probably. Uh, yeah. And that was when I guess they, Khrushchev exiles, basically exiles Svetlana. Yeah. Did anything else happen in that scene? No, I think that was it. I think they go to the end where they, they give the little text summaries. Mm, yeah. And the next thing they... They do another concert. They're at the concert and Khrushchev is there taking it in as premier of the Soviet Union. He, I guess it, it does talk about it correctly here that he is in kind of a triumvirate with the other leaders, right? But then he yeah. demotes them and takes power himself. That's, that, that is how it happens. Jeez. It's not really bloody or anything with them. No one, they don't get executed. But okay. they do kind of lose their power. And the guy behind him, Brezhnev. Yeah, yeah. He was going to be next. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Eyebrows. I haven't heard of him. Leonard Brezhnev was premier of the Soviet Union during the... No, he was there for a long time. Huh. It was during the 70s and... I meant... This is stupid. Again, showing my whole ass here. I mentally get Khrushchev and Gorbachev mixed up. I don't know why. I both just, they both kind of opened men. stuff up, right? Yes, you're right. Okay. Yeah. 
both yeah. and they're bald, both bald bald men <laughs> they both open stuff up somewhat khrushchev though was more of a cold warrior he was more okay you he know, was the Bay of Pigs guy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. C- Cuban Missile Crisis guy, actually. Yeah. Okay. And he, you know, he's the one who, you know, wanted to still... He was confrontational with the West still. Okay. Okay. But Gorbachev was the one who would do anything for a Pizza Hut commercial. I mean, he was the <laughs> one who really wanted to basically turn to social democracy. Okay. Uh, Brezhnev was in the late 60s through the very early 80s. Okay. Um, and his time is kind of more of a tightening down, more of a stagnation overall in the economy. Mm. Okay. It's kind of like they go into like peaks and valleys, it seems like. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So that's that kind of wraps it up, I guess. That kind of wraps yeah, up pretty the, much. the synopsis. Oh, question. I assume, so between like, I guess, kind of acts of the movie, they would show quotes uh, like you know, the body shall be laying out for the people or whatever. I assume that that's like from their constitution or something. I believe it would say so. Like article. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think it's from the Soviet constitution. Cool. Yeah, it was a cool movie. I liked it. I thought this was a funny movie. I thought it was good. I I give it. Um, I'll give it an A minus. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, letter grade. Uh, yeah. A. I'm gonna give it a B plus. I'm gonna be. Mm. Ooh. Uh, well, no, you can give it a B plus. I almost gave it a B plus because I, I mean I thought it was like I mean this kind of gets into our review of it I guess. Sure, but let's do that. It's it's funny. Like I laughed for it's sure. Funny, it's witty, it's quick, it's you know. Yeah, it's funny in a quiet way. I think like it's not like like Kyle said like is this a comedy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you have to be paying attention. You have to be like you have to kind of understand what they're trying to do. I think, I think you need a lot of context going into this movie. Like yeah. at the very beginning I've struggled cause I'm like, who the fuck are these people? Like, I don't know anything, but by the end I was like, okay, like, I think I would enjoy it a lot on a, on a rewatch. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you have to understand the context of like, this is funny because it's funny that they're incompetent, but it's not like in a, I don't know. It, it's funny that they're incompetent, but and it's it's showing like the perils of like kind of the group think and like the the scramble for power and stuff like that. But it's also done so badly that it's not just like scary. It's just like funny. Yeah, they're you're kind of re- reducing in stature these huge figures that otherwise could be you know so intimidating as you would never laugh at them. But yeah, this really could easily be. Size like a dark game of thrones kind of thing of like oh just fighting for power but instead they're just like let's make it fucking funny <laughs> yeah i think so i do you know like i said appreciate its humor and everything and you're right that that kind of requires a lot of context to appreciate it mm-hmm. i think that it does a pretty good job of presenting and this is where we'll get a little bit of flack for our more hard line left listeners because we're going to be kind of lousy sock dems here or and comms <laughs> and critique from the left. But it does present, I think, a good critique of this kind of oligarchic power. Yeah. Yeah. It shows what happens if just one guy is fucking so in charge that like, even though you have a constitution that says, hey, this guy's going to take over, that doesn't fucking work. You know, like there's this culture of fear. There's this culture of paranoia. And it is clearly inefficient and dangerous you know like it shows that like that does not work (laughs) yeah because and this is another thing like if you do look at the soviet constitution there are so many rights protected for people you know Mm -hmm. people have so many rights protected in there that are just wholly not observed during the stalin period or during long periods of the soviet union if you're in the wrong group you know yeah exactly if you're if you're gay you're you're not getting these Mm -hmm. protections you know if for whatever reason you've crossed the regime, like we mentioned in the myths thing where they, where they locked people up in psychiatric hospitals, like, yeah, that could just happen to you. But the constitution, you know, would actually lay out all these protections and freedoms and rights that people had way more. So really way more so than the United States, other yeah, Western yeah. democracies and it's government in terms of it's like supposed how it's supposed to be democratic was way more democratic too how it was supposed to be run, right? You have the workers' councils, the Soviets and stuff that are able to like v- vote on their local leadership. Mm-hmm. And you had that 
basically you had to have enough votes to win. Like you couldn't just run unopposed basically mm -hmm. like that's yeah. huge. But in practice you did run unopposed, right? They like subverted that instead of having mm -hmm. where you could vote for whoever, right? You didn't have this and multi-party thing. It's not necessary, but it just is supposed to be way more free than it ends up being, you know? Yeah. So uh, I, I, what I meant with all that is to tie it back to when you're saying one person's in charge and the constitution says who comes next one mm -hmm. person really shouldn't even be in charge it's for sure in it, overall it's supposed to be governed by like the supreme soviet the the mm -hmm. people elected by the people gradually up to the supreme soviet level but what actually happened was of those guys you had the executive council of those guys you had the politburo and in the politburo you had just the one guy you know. Yeah. So I guess I my question is like what what makes the difference between a Stalin who like has absolute power and a you know a fucking Georgie who like does whatever the fuck people tell him? I mean, it's just personality, right? Uh, yeah. Because I mean, there's a lot of like power play politic kind of stuff in there too. But and, and I guess I'm just like curious as to how this actually worked slash did not work. <laughs> So I think it did not work because you're wholly relying on personalities to make it work one way or the other. Mm -hmm. If you had a system in place where regardless of if you had a Stalin or a Khrushchev or a Georgie, whoever's in charge, whether they're strong willed or not, basically, mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to take supreme power for themselves. Exactly. And, and like the system need. will still run. That yeah. would That'd be actually good. <laughs> it's interesting. I'm teaching about the constitution in the, the unit we're on in school. And oh, one God. of the things I'm trying to tell them is look other, you know, other countries have had literal dictators and stuff, but not because they just had some mean guys, but because they had a government in place that let somebody take complete power. Mm -hmm. I showed them a list, you know, just like a picture with all the presidents on them. And it's like, look, we don't know. We have no idea if one of these guys really would prefer to have been an absolute dictator. But even if they had a secret plan to do it, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, the government's not set up to allow them to take all that power for themselves. And then, of course, I had to launch into like a basic defense of like our dumb <laughs> system of government. But the point was that like... I was going to say, that sounded very patriotic for you. <laughs> yeah, but the point was like, you know, in general and not just in America, like other countries have avoided this too, but you want to set up your government to where you can't have one asshole take complete control. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know the the dings on the movie are just kind of falling into basic kind of anti-Soviet tropes about, you know, just commies bad sort of thing. Like I think they yeah. take some pot shots. I think they do too, but I think it's interesting that they don't take them in the way that I would expect. Like we talked about the apartments. Mm -hmm. I feel like they didn't spend a whole lot of time being like, look how poor and starving everyone is. And look how sad it is here. Like there wasn't a lot of that. And I, I understand we were like looking at a higher like class of people or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean that in the class, that's not like they were cool. <laughs> but um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. They didn't spend too much time on that. And it was more about like, just showing how bad of a system it was mm -hmm. in terms of like how ineffective it was instead of how how economically bad it was i guess well it comes across as kind of trotskyist like this criticism mm -hmm. of a degenerated worker state right how it's supposed to be for the people and everything and it started out that way and stuff but the government the bureaucracy the new cast of people at the top has corrupted it and and made it bad you know, it's yeah. like, that seems to be generally the critique because you see there's a lot of sympathy for the ordinary people coming in to see their their fallen beloved leader. You see a lot of yeah. sympathy for regular folks trying to live their lives when they when the peasants come in to watch the to watch the new the, the second concert. <laughs> the lady's eating like pickled eggs. <laughs> yeah, I think that there, you know, there is an, a side of you or a side of the audience that wants to view it as kind of like, look at these rubes. But I mm -hmm. think that they're also presented somewhat sympathetically, like, hey, they're getting to watch it like a concert and everything, and they're yeah. just living their lives, and they're doing this now, and that's okay. I think even, like, the conductor or, like, the guys in the sound booth, like, those were all, 
I mean, they're, you know, like slightly better off than like the, the super poor that come in there. But I think those characters too are very sympathetic of like, they're just trying to fucking get by. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, I think how it does it well, because like you said, you don't, they don't engage too much and they don't kick down too much. They do. Yeah. They're not like, let's show the long, you know, bread lines. Let's show, you know, all these starving masses and stuff like that. It's more about like, let's focus on like how crazy this government is and not on like the effectiveness of them if that makes sense yeah for sure and i think where i would ding them points on that though is their care and it's just satire it's satire so i get mm -hmm. wanting to do that but leaders in our own country in every country i think while they may they have a large element of self-interest and stuff generally don't go into the business just to see <laughs> how many people they can fuck over and rip off yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I, I think there's a lot of, I don't know. I I don't know if that's true. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> well, I don't, okay, I don't know. I, I think I, I respond that way because I listen to a lot of the West Wing thing. Shout out to the West Wing thing. You're one of my favorite podcasts. <laughs> if you have your questions about communist shit, they don't talk about communism on that show, but if they do, <laughs> come come talk to me. Anyway, they talk a lot about how the premise of that show is that it's like, good people working in government and like that's the whole thing and yeah. it they go too far the other way where it's like clearly they are in here for the right reasons you know yes and yeah they do. so i think i'm just resistant to it for that reason i think there's a mix i think there are easier ways to enrich yourself there are easier ways oh, just for to, sure <laughs> you to won't get killed rip people off and to exert power maybe not power maybe that's it it's just just seeking power yeah but you don't see uh, do you seek power if you think you have no fucking idea what's going on? Like, you think you have ideas to fix things for the groups that you care about, right? Like, at the basic level, you don't have to main, you don't have to think, I'm going to make society better over, you don't have to be completely benevolent, but you do think that you could make things work better for some group that you care about. I mean, I think, yeah, I think that's just the question is, what group do you care about? Right, yeah. And, and I think some of these people cared about their own groups. Like, Chuck and Barry cared about, like, Obviously, self-preservation. Mary, yeah, Mary was sort of psychopath, sociopathic almost. And Definitely. Uh, really yeah. only cared about himself. Fair. But I don't know. Molotov, I think, cared about, you know, was cared about the party and thought the party was going to do the right things. That's what he believed, you know? Yeah. I couldn't get a good read on Khrushchev. Like, I feel like he was supposed to be the hero. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I thought that was interesting. Some of it's based on, I haven't read it, but I have read about it classic wikipedia mm -hmm. stuff but like <laughs> khrushchev's accounts of things his memoirs okay. and stuff uh some of those were like drawn anecdotally from that i think some of the things that his quotes especially but no i think he is presented as kind of the kind of the hero in a way yeah i mean he gets to take down the big bad and take power so yeah mm -hmm. i just feel it was a very mixed portrayal and it was interesting like and i, I think there was nuance i mean yeah it was fucking like a comedy and they were idiots and like i think on some level you can just see that and be like obviously communism is for idiots but i think it well i don't think that was the point i think the point was this version of it was very bad like in in the sense of like the power vacuum in the sense of when you're only fighting for yourself and it's all like like the group think thing i keep coming back to that version of it would suck yeah. And I think sense. we have that like in other kinds of government too. Like that's not like a fucking unique thing to to the Soviet Union. I definitely agree with that. Really any government where you don't have, you know, a defined transfer of power in addition to that actually coming that actually being carried out peacefully and and normally. Any place you don't have that, you're going to end up with this like palace intrigue when it all comes mm -hmm. down to it, right? any monarchies or anything you you might have this kind of like period of possible instability anything that has that power that people want that people will claw at you're, you're going to have this instability when the person in power is gone right yeah uh, all right do we want to do we want to wrap up there we have anything else we want to oh i think i think it was good um i enjoyed it i really liked georgie he was my favorite <laughs> oh, favorite character him. georgie okay. georgie my favorite character is either I love Khrushchev. He was great. He was my second favorite for sure. Or Molotov, because just mm, yeah. I have Michael Palin. He's great. So 
<laughs> okay. All right. So let's uh, let's call it there. What do you want to learn about next time, or maybe do some sort of a research project, do some sort of presentation <laughs> next time? Yeah, I want to get to that gay shit next time. All right. <laughs> So uh, I'll I'll take over teaching, and we'll talk about queer spaces and communism. Uh, I'm gonna kind of try to do like a brief overview of some queer history in terms of communism and leftism and socialism. Okay. Uh, but I also want to talk about like the state of it today. So. Awesome. This is great. Uh, is there any homework you want me to do ahead of time? Any um, reading or perusing or? Yeah, I'll send you some links. Okay, awesome. I'll gladly do it. I might it. actually send you some shit that I tried to read and was like, this is boring. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll make you I read my homework. It. If anything, okay. I'll figure out a synopsis or something to read. It was very academic, and I was like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> Ooh, academic stuff is tough, but I can probably manage. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> cool. Well, I'm excited for that. Yeah, um, that sounds fun. Yeah. In the meantime, you can find us online. We are on Instagram at Teach Me Communism. Twitter at Teach Communism. You can send us an email, teachmecommunism at gmail.com. If you want to send us a question for a future listener Q&A episode, if you have a suggestion for a future episode topic, we're always open to that. If there's a really cool communist movie you want us to watch for next communist movie night, we're down for that too. Yeah. We've already got some suggestions in the list though, but we'll yeah, add it's a pretty it big to list. it and we'll get to it. We kind of wanted to go with something that required less like research and stuff so <laughs> we wanted to take a break things have been a lot lately i don't know if you knew that i don't know if you've woken up from your coma but there's a lot happening right now <laughs> <laughs> anyway we have a patreon patreon.com slash teach me communism uh, if you support us at the five dollar level or up you can get notes for our episodes uh, i didn't take any notes this time but you can read grady's notes they're pretty good notes pretty good notes <laughs> <laughs> and uh we will also be donating those to a local mutual aid fund so that's oh, cool. yeah uh we are also on youtube if that's your preferred listening method so just give us a search there teach me communism and make sure to give us a review on apple podcasts that is one of the best ways for people to find us and it brings up our star rating we're at 4.5 now because we have a lot of hate listeners so go out there and give us love i need it i need the validation yeah that's i don't know i'm working on it in therapy okay <laughs> i wouldn't bother to listen to a show that i didn't like i don't know yeah that's a time investment these people have too much time in their hands i guess anyway go in there negate their reviews bring us back up to a 5.0 that would make me quite yeah happy. and tell your friends to review us but only like your cool friends you know yeah yeah give it to your coolest friend uh yeah make sure also to stay angry out there yeah please do like you can be happy that's fine i'm not trying to be I, don't know, I posted something like i'm i'm your cranky leftist friend i guess like <laughs> you can celebrate sure but i also want you fucking showing up the next day like please please keep giving mutual aid please keep learning about socialism and telling other people about it you know you know the plan we've talked about our plan enough times on here two prongs go for it yeah all right all right guys thanks for listening this week and uh next week you can catch us on another episode of teach me communism where the class struggle is always in session bye adios